Well, one of the great joys that I have as a pastor is to get to pray for you, and I do that regularly. And uh, from time to time, when God gives me a chance to do that here, it's just fun to do that. And, uh, and so I thank you. And uh, we just continue to pray for God to work in your lives. And uh, maybe we'll be able to hear in the very near future. Uh, you stand as John did and said, the Lord is my shepherd. This is what he did for me. And uh, we're trusting and believing that uh, for each one of you. Well, I'm glad to be here today as we uh, get back into our study in uh, Psalm 23. And those of you that are OCD are excited that we're back too. Because last time we were together, um, I gave you an outline with four blanks, and we only filled in one. And there have been three blanks, empty all week long. And it is just driving some of you crazy. And so uh, you're back today to fill in those blanks so that your life can somehow become normal. Don't you just love the diversity in the body of Christ? Isn't that fun? That there are some of you that that because there were four blanks and we only covered one of them, it bothers you and there are others of you in the room to say, I, I didn't even know we had notes. And there's still others of you that say, well, I don't even remember what you talked about last week. It hadn't bothered me. I forgot the minute we walked out. And then there are still others of you that only come about every other week, so you don't have a clue what I'm talking about. Sometimes being a pastor is kind of like herding cats, you know, but it is fun. And, uh, and I enjoy the opportunity. We've been going through the book of Psalms, or, or not the book of Psalms, but Psalm 23, and it's been an incredible journey. We are moving at lightning speed as we've made our way to verse 3 in Psalm 23, and we began looking at verse 3 last time we were together, and we'll finish it in our time together today. Remember I told you that the structure of Psalm 23 is such that the psalmist provides us with rhyming thoughts rather than rhyming words. What that means is every one of the verses have two phrases that must be taken together to fully understand what he is saying. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Because he is my shepherd, I have no lack in my life. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He, he leads me beside quiet waters. He knows me, and he loves me, and he provides for me times of peace and rest in my life. In verse 3, he restores my soul and guides me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Last time we were together, we began to talk about what it means to be restored and how that every one of us need to be restored. He restores my soul. Everything about who I am is restored. The word restored, you remember we discovered why we need restoration and what that means because we discovered that, that sheep are prone to wonder. There's a tendency in sheep to, to wander away from the shepherd. They, they don't do it intentionally, and it's not because they are rebelling. It's just that they get sidetracked. They, 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 they follow off maybe as they graze along and lose uh, consciousness as to where the rest of the flock is. And over time, they wander away, and they're lost. Sheep, as they're getting close to the time when they need to be sheared, are top heavy and it's not uncommon for them to fall and as they trip and fall because of the weight uh, of the wool they fall they are unable to get up again because they are so large when they lay over on their side there they, they will flail in the air with their legs but unable to get up and and there is a term for that it's called cast c-a-s-t to be cast and as a result of that shepherds are constantly counting their sheep to make sure that they're all there. And if one is missing, they will begin to go after that one that is missing, knowing that it is probable that he has fallen or she has fallen and they are cast, helpless and left in that condition. They will die 
And the shepherd goes to find them, and he picks them up. And that process of lifting them up and putting them back on their feet and leading them back into the path of the flock is called restoration. We discovered that in life. Many of us, not because of rebellion, but many of us make bad decisions and One decision after another leads us further and further and further away from God until we wake up one day on our backs, unable to get up. And he comes and he restores us. Now we also discover that there are two important truths that we need to know as we understand and apply this to our life. According to the text, only the shepherd can restore us. He restores my soul. You can't restore your own soul. Now we try, but everything we try fails. We think if I can just get to a certain place, everything will be all right. If this can happen in my life, everything will be all right. And most of us have lived long enough to know that when we do happen to accomplish that, it's not all right. We can't restore our own soul. Only the shepherd can do that. And if you are desperately in need of restoration today, here's the good news. Only the shepherd can, and he will, if you let him. Secondly, I also want you to understand that once he sets us back on the path, we have to follow. If we don't make an effort to follow, we'll end up right back where we were to start with. And so the last time we were together, we began to look at how when we are restored, we can stay on the path of righteousness. And I told you there are four steps that we can take, and we talked about the first step when we were together, the first step in following the path of righteousness that God gives us is to trust the shepherd. That might be one of the most difficult steps. You cannot follow someone you don't trust. And we follow him only because we trust him. And if we trust him, we will follow him. Now, I would tell you it's difficult because there are times when God leads us in paths that don't make any sense. There are times when We can read the Bible and we know that God wants the best for us and and God wants what's good for us and, and we know what's good for us and it seems that where God is leading us is in the opposite direction of that. But we also know, if you think about it, that sometimes in life in order to get to your destination, you have to travel for a while in a direction that seems to be opposite of that destination. If you've ever driven in the mountains, you know what I'm talking about. I'm trying to go here, but I'm driving this way. But I thought I was going here. But you have to trust that this road's going to take me here, even though I'm going in the opposite direction. And, and, and eventually I make a turn. And I think, wow, okay, I, I can see the destination I turn. But guess what? Then after a few miles, I'm going that way. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, I just came from that direction. Now I'm going back in the direction I came. Seldom does God lead us directly to the destination, but but often the path goes in directions that don't make any sense. And the only way you'll stay on the path is to trust the shepherd. You see, the reason many of us get in a bind is because we don't trust the shepherd. We we, we think, you know what, he's leading me this way. I don't think he knows what he's doing because I need to be going that way. And so, God, because you're leading me this way and I need to be going that way, I'm going to leave the path and I'm going this way. And we all know what happens, but that seems to be the standard of our lives. And so, the first step that we've got to take is to trust the shepherd. And I want to tell you something. The hardest thing in the world that we ever have to do as a child of God is to trust him Because there are many, many, many times when he doesn't make any sense. There are many times when his ways I don't understand. So trust the shepherd. We talked about that last time. 
Today we begin with talking about the second step in the path. If I'm going to trust the Savior, then the second step that I need to take is to, number two, obey the shepherd. Years ago, John Samus captured this idea when he wrote the words of an old hymn, When We Walk With the Lord. Many of you might remember that old hymn, When We Walk With the Lord. The chorus simply says this, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. The concept of trust and obey are twin thoughts. The first step in restoration, the first step in walking the path of righteousness is the trust, but the second is obedience. I believe that actually obedience is trust in action. But now here's the good news. You don't have to wait for God to reveal his plan and his purpose. You don't have to fast and pray. You don't have to read all kinds of books. You don't have to struggle to figure out what is it that God wants and where does God want me to be and what is God's will for my life. There are many of you that are here today and and you say, Pastor, I trust God and and, and I want to be obedient, but I, I just don't know what God wants me to do. I'm not sure where I'm to go. I don't know what God wants to do in my life. I'm not sure what my calling is. I don't know what my purpose is. And and I've read books on how to determine God's will for my life. And I've I've read books or I'm uh, attempting to find books that will help me understand my purpose in life. And I pray and I fast in order to discover the path of righteousness. But I just don't know what it is. Well, here's the good news. We begin the path of righteousness by following the path that God has already set forth. You don't have to ask God where he wants you to go. Just do what you already know he wants you to do. There are some things in the Bible that God has already revealed. We don't have to pray about it. We don't have to search for it. We don't have to fast and wonder. We don't have to read any books. There are some things that God has said, this is what I want you to do. If you are my child, do this. And all we have to do is be obedient to what we already know. First place we begin is we know that the Bible tells us God's desire is for every one of us to be saved. God's desire is for every one of us to know him personally. God wants you to come to the place in your life where you acknowledge that you are a sinner and cannot save yourself. That you sinned and he is holy and righteous. And God wants you to admit that you are a sinner. The Bible says it is God's plan and purpose for all of us to be saved. He has come and lived and died in order that every one of us would know him personally. We know that God wants us to admit that we are sinners. We know that God wants us to ask him to forgive us of our sin. We know that God wants us to invite him to be the Savior and Lord of our lives. And the first step in a walk with God begins when we do that. So I've just asked you the question, have you done that? Has there come a time in your life when you acknowledge you are a sinner? God, I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. I'm not going to go to heaven because I'm good or I'm perfect. I'm not. But I believe, God, you came to earth and the person of Jesus lived a sinless life. I don't know why you would love me, but I believe you do. And I'm going to ask you to forgive me of my life. I give you control of my life. I want you to be my Savior. And I ask you to be my Lord. Have you done that? That's the first step. You know, the Bible also tells us if we are a child of God, that God wants us to walk in the Spirit. He wants us to be filled with the Spirit of God. He wants us to be controlled by God's Spirit. You don't have to pray about that, ask about that. God's purpose, he's already said, be filled with the Holy Spirit. What that means is God wants us to get off the throne of our life and make him Lord of our life. To simply say every day, God, what do you want to do in my life today? Where do you want to go? How do you want me to live? I report for duty today. God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Allow me to think with your mind. Operate in your strength. Walk in your grace. 
Show me what you want to do in my life today. I yield to you. Every day we can get up and do that. Every day we can put on the armor of God, as we've talked about before, recognizing that we are at war and I need you. And I put on the breastplate of righteousness, acknowledging who I am in you. And, and my feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And I take the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit and the helmet of salvation, and, and I put that on. There are so many things God has already revealed to us that we need to be doing. My question is, are you doing it? Are you doing the things that God has already revealed or are you sitting there praying that God will reveal something brand new to you? God has clearly identified his will in many areas of our life. The Bible often gives commands to us to regulate our behavior. Don't kill, don't steal, don't cheat, don't lie. Honor your parents, love your wife, respect your husband. There are so many things that the Bible has told us that we are to do, and we don't have to pray about them. We know this is what God wants us to do. And what we do as we follow the path of righteousness is just do what you know he already wants you to do. You know what's amazing? As we begin to do what God has already revealed, his plan and purpose become clear to us. These are the places that God is leading us. This is the path of his righteousness. And when we stray from the path, listen to this. When we stray from the path, God doesn't give us a new one. You see, many of you, when you are come back to God and you ask God to forgive you and, and please restore me, and he picks us up and he puts us back on the path, we're expecting new things. And God says, okay, go back and pick up where you left off. The word repent means to turn back, a U-turn. You have gone in a direction that is not the way I have led you. So how do I get out of this? I'm not going to give you a new direction. Go back. For many of you, the answer to getting back on the path of righteousness is to go back where you fell off. Go back to that. There are things that you are doing in your life that you should not be doing. Stop and go back. There are things that we need to be doing in our life that we are not doing. Stop and go back. And as I begin to do what God invites me to do, as I let go of the things that God has told me that I should not do, I find myself on that path. I've wandered away. And so when I get off track, he comes to us and he leads us back. And we got to trust him. But we also must follow him in obedience. It's interesting that every time Jesus called a disciple, he said to them, follow me. Follow me. I, I want you to, to leave behind those things. And your job is simple. Follow me. You don't have to worry about where we're going. And, and I want to tell you something. If you ever come to understand this, it is freeing. The, the walk with Christ, the path of righteousness is an exciting journey because I don't have to stress over it. My job's just to follow him. And the closer I stay to him, the easier it is to follow. And when he turns, I turn. And when he moves, I move. And when he stops, I stop. And, and, and my job's just to follow him. I don't have to stress about it, worry about it, fret about it. He's the shepherd. He invites me to follow him and listen to me carefully to accept the invitation. I have to obey in the areas I already know. Now, let me say that again, because if I give you something brand new, you're so excited about it. But if I'm going to follow the Savior... I've got to follow him in the areas that I already know. God's already revealed his plan and purpose to us. So the second thing that I've got to do to stay on the path, trust him and then obey him and walk in that obedience. Walk it out. The third thing that I've got to do if I'm going to stay on path is I need to delight in the shepherd. As I mentioned, the first time that we came together, Psalm 23 is a psalm about a relationship. 
the relationship that David had with his sheep, the relationship that a shepherd has with his sheep. It's a psalm of relationship. First time I ever had the opportunity to go to Israel was in the 1980s. And my Tanya and I had the opportunity to go, and, and we had a free day in Jerusalem, and, and we were going around the outside of the walls, and we came to, to the sheep gate in the wall. It was a part of the market where they would bring animals, and, and, um, and it was just so much activity that was going on. And, and I'll have to tell you, in the 1980s, one of the things that I was fascinated by uh, way back then was that, uh, that when I came to Israel, I noticed that the taxi cabs in Israel were Mercedes Benz. And I thought that was interesting because at that time in America, uh, Mercedes Benz was the luxury car. There were no cabs that were Mercedes Benz. That was the luxury car top of the line. But I, I realized in Israel that a Mercedes Benz is just the taxi cab that people ride in. And so I was kind of fascinated by that and, and paying attention to that as, as something that was unique and different. And, and we walked out the sheep gate together, and, and all of a sudden this Mercedes-Benz taxi cab pulls up to the side there, and, and, uh, and it caught my attention as they always did. But to my absolute amazement, the back door of the Mercedes-Benz taxi cab opens, and out jump four or five sheep <laughs> and a shepherd. Literally, kid you not, we're standing there and the door opens and sheep get out of the back of a Mercedes Benz with their shepherd. And I thought to myself, Psalm 23. In Israel, shepherds love their sheep so much they haul them around in Mercedes Benz. This was amazing to me. God invites us to follow him, and we do that as we trust and obey, but thirdly, we delight in the shepherd. It's a relationship. The shepherd loves his sheep, and the sheep love their shepherd. And when the sheep delight in the shepherd, they follow closely. You see, because it is the nature of sheep to wander away, Listen to me. Some are really good at it. They're repeat offenders. And the shepherd discovers that some of the sheep that wander away constantly wander away. He goes and gets them and he restores them and he brings them back and he's counting sheep again and guess what? There's one missing and, and, and by now, it's like, I know who it is. And so he goes looking. He's not looking for a sheep. He's looking for that sheep. And he finds them and lovingly picks them up, restores them, brushes them off. With gratitude, the sheep looks into the eyes of the shepherd, and he puts them back with the flock. And then the next time he counts... He's gone again. Well, doesn't that describe some of you and myself? It does. Aren't there times that we just wander away and he brings us back? And, man, it hadn't been that long. That he, and, and, and here I am again. Man, I just got back, and all of a sudden, here I am again. Far from God. How did I get here? Why did I do that? I knew better. I know that this decision is going to lead me here. And here I am again. And lovingly, the shepherd comes and gets me. Now, we're going to learn something later on. We're going, to love, we're going to learn that the shepherd knows us well, and he also has at his disposal two very important things. He has a rod and he has a staff. And for those repeat offenders, he has an answer to that. And some of the challenges that we have in life are because we're repeat offenders. We constantly run away. And so at some point, God, you know, the shepherd says, you know what, Carol, you do this over and over and over again. And there's going to come a time, one of these days, you're going to wander away and you're going to fall over. And there's going to be a wolf that gets to you before I do. I can't let you continue in this pattern of behavior. 
and I'm going to do something about it. And we'll talk about that later. But what we've discovered here in the text before us is that there are some sheep that just wander away. And your spiritual life, you know who you are, your spiritual life is like this. It's up and down and up and down and up and down. And I'm right with God and everything's good. And then Monday, boom, here I am again. And then next Sunday, man, I'm sorry, God, please forgive me. Restore me to right fellowship. I want to be what I want. And boom, I'm back up here and I'm excited and we're worshiping God. And Monday, boom, here I am again. You know who you are. Your life's like this. And what's frustrating to us is that there are some people, and we know them, whose lives are not like that. There are some people that seem to have a relationship with God that, that kind of looks like a line that moves upward. Every now and then it'll have a blip in it, but it's just not up and down. It, it, it moves more like this, and then there's a blip, and, and then they come back, and they, they, they stay with God for a while. You know people like that. They seem to have a relationship with God and hear God, and, and we look at them and wonder, what is it about you that God favors? Why is it that you can hear the voice of God? Why is it that you can stay strong? Why is it that you seem to have a faith that holds you when I just seem to fall off the wagon so easily? I think the difference might be in this. There are some sheep that delight in the shepherd. There's some sheep that just love being around the shepherd, and they want to be around the shepherd and so every time, every time they can, they're right there beside him. And, and they just, they, they eat close to him because they just love being around him. They don't want to be far away. They're constantly aware of the shepherd. He's my shepherd. And, and, and the love that they have for the shepherd keeps them close. So that when the shepherd moves, they move because they stay close. And the closer we stay to the shepherd, when we delight in the shepherd... Following him is, is easy. When we delight in the shepherd, we follow him because we just want to be in his presence. And so we follow him everywhere he goes. I've got a Weimaraner, and um, my wife laughs at the relationship that I have with this dog. She says it's just not normal. Um, but I just really like this dog, and he really kind of likes me. And... Um, and he's unique in a lot of ways, but um, we're, we're actually, right now, we're, we're in a time of turmoil at my house. We're remodeling a bathroom downstairs and a master bedroom, so we're upstairs in, um, in, in what was one of the kids' rooms. We're living up there. So we got his kennel upstairs, and uh, he sleeps in a kennel at night, and so he goes in the kennel and he sleeps. And so the first thing that happens every morning, uh, when I get up, I get up first, and, and so I'll get up, and, um, and the first thing I do is walk over and open the kennel door. And, um, and then I just stand there for a second because I know I need to, and I'll stand there for just a second. And he, he gets out, and the first thing he does is stretches. And, I mean, he'll just stretch for a minute. And then the next thing he does is he comes in, he puts his head right up against my leg, just as hard as you can press against my leg. He'll push his head up against my leg and move his head up and down, just kind of loving on me for a moment. And we walk from the kennel over to the top of the stairs. And he walks to the top of the stairs, and I stop there because that's, that's hug number two. And at hug number two, he just puts his head right up against me and just kind of hugs on me. I mean, he, he literally is hugging on me and uh, moving his head, and then we'll walk down the first little ramp of stairs to get ready to turn, and I'll stop again because that's hug number three that's coming right there. And, and it's interesting. This dog just loves to be with me. And wherever I go in the house, he goes. It doesn't make any difference what everybody else is doing. If I'm upstairs, he's upstairs. If I'm downstairs, he's downstairs. If I'm outside, he's outside. He just delights in me. And you know what? It's so fun because I delight in him. And when you delight in the shepherd, you just want to be wherever he is. And, and, and so it's easy to follow him because you just, and so listen, if you want to stay on the path of righteousness, trust him. Hadn't he proven himself trustworthy? Yes. So you trust him. Always trust. Number two, obey him. Do the things you already know. Don't wait for new stuff. Do the stuff he's already told you to do. Number three, delight yourself in the Lord. And number four, this one's going to surprise you. This one's, this one's a little different, but it's a fun one. 
If we're going to stay on the path of righteousness, we have to trust in the Savior. We have to obey the Savior. We have to delight in the Savior. And here's number four. You ready? Do what you want to do. You're not expecting that. Because our understanding of the shepherd is he's always telling us what not to do. We think that God has a bunch of rules and regulations and and he's constantly, you know, he's sitting there with a lightning bolt waiting for the chance to zap us whenever we do something wrong. And you know what the psalmist said? No, I'm a shepherd. And I provide for my sheep. And when my sheep follow me, just go be sheep. Do whatever sheep do. Hang out and enjoy being a sheep. That's That's what you are. I don't have to teach you to be a sheep. You're a sheep. Go do it. I'm just asking you to follow me. I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to make sure all your needs are met. I'm going to make sure everything you need is taken care of so that you can do what you want to do. Now, that sounds kind of crazy for me to say that God would actually say to us, do whatever you want to do. But when we trust him and when we obey him and when we delight in him, guess what? What we're going to want to do is going to be in concert with what he tells us to do and the fact that we trust him and that we're in his presence. Here's the deal. God knows you better than you know yourself. And he is calling you to a life that is always, always, always in line with who you are. Why would God ask you to do something that's not in keeping with your personality? He would never do that. He knows your personality made you. Do what you want to do. When we trust and obey and delight in him, our walk with him leads us to his purpose and his will and his plan. The scriptures even tell us that if we will delight ourselves in the Lord, he'll give us the desires of our heart. If we delight in the Lord, really the better way to say it is if I delight in him, he will give me desires that are consistent with his will for my life. I think the only way I can tell you this, what it looks like, is to tell you my own story. And you've heard, you've heard it before, but I just have to tell you again because my story is a story that illustrates, well, God giving us an opportunity to do what we want. My dad was a pastor all my life growing up, and, and so uh, he would preach revivals in different churches around and, and we would go with him as a family. And the number one question always asked of a pastor's kids in those situations by total strangers in a church that you're visiting is, are you going to be a preacher like your dad when you grow up? I always had a quick answer to that. No. No. I do not want to be a pastor. I want to be a pilot. I want to fly jets for the Navy. That's what I'm going to do. And I used to build airplanes. Man, I had model airplanes hanging from the ceiling in my room. Uh, I would get model airplanes for Christmas, put them together all year long. And the next Christmas season came, you could buy fireworks. I'd get firecrackers and blow up the planes that I made as I would have war and then get new ones and put them together for the next year. And um, I was fascinated by that. That's what I wanted to do. And many of you are saying, but yeah, look at you. You're doing what you said you didn't want to do. Isn't that evidence that God called you to do something you don't want to do? Let me just say this from my own experience. God will never call you to do something you don't want to do. He just changes our want to's. And, And it's not tricky and it's not mean. I just remember as a 13 year old kid, come into a fun place in my life where I just experienced God and delighted in him and I just loved him so much that I just wanted him more than anything else in the world and as a 13 year old kid I said God I want what you want I don't care about any of my plans your plans matter and God changed the desire of my heart 
and suddenly gave me a desire to pastor. And you know what? I get to do every week what I want to do. This isn't a J-O-B to me. I, I want to do this. It's, this is, it's who I am. It's who God made me. A and so God uniquely crafts us and when we are delighting in him and trusting in him and obeying him, suddenly he's like, what do you want to do? Let me give you another quick answer and we're done. 20 years ago, I became pastor here. I was thinking about that this morning. Every time God has ever led me to a church, it was always a clear leading. A church that I went to in Louisiana after I was in seminary here and in uh, 1984, it was clear. I, I, I mean, I, I was praying that we could go to Alaska. My wife was praying that we go back to Louisiana. Now you know who has the best prayer life. <laughs> and um, God led me back to my hometown to pastor a church in my hometown. And it was so clear when we went that this is exactly what God wants. One of those moments when you just know, this is it. And I pastored there for six years, and at the end of that six-year period of time, God called me to a church in Baton Rouge, and it was so clear. It was so clear, his calling, that when we went to Baton Rouge, it was like, this is, we know, this is exactly what he wants and where he wants. I was in Baton Rouge for eight years, and then this church contacted me, and it's a long story there. But when I came here to preach in, in view of a call to preach and, 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 and look at the church, and you were looking at me 20 years ago, I told my family, we're just, I, I just, I, I think I'm just going to, I can't find God's purpose or I don't know what he wants. So we're just going to have to go and, and preach. And it was an old building that was right here. And we were parked right outside here. And I remember we were here and after everything settled, we went back and got in the, the, the car and we were for our, the first time together as a family. Um, I got in the car and all of a sudden you feel everybody looking at you and everybody in the family's looking at me like, okay. You said we had to come here and you got to preach and then you'll know. Do you know? And I'm like, you know what? I don't know. I don't know. And it concerned me. And I went home and I began to pray. And you know what I think God said? Well, I don't think. This is what I believe that God said to me. What do you want to do? I can use you in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The last Sunday I was in that church, we had a higher attendance than we had ever had before. I can use you right here. If you want to stay in Baton Rouge, stay. If you want to go to Fort Worth, go to Fort Worth. I can use you either place. Carol, what do you want to do? And I remember saying this. I don't want to choose. I want you to tell me what you want me to do. And God's like, well, I don't care. What do you want to do? You're walking with me. You're trusting me. You're obedient. You're delighting yourself in me. What do you want to do? And I remember saying, God, I think I might want to go to Fort Worth. I, I think that'd be a really neat challenge, a new opportunity. And it was as if God said, sounds good. Let's go to Fort Worth. And what a journey it's been. What a trip. Never dreamed then that it would be what it has been. But the fun thing about walking with God is that he made you. He gave you spiritual gifts. He gave you abilities. He gave you passion and a heart. He gave you experiences that you've had in life. And all of that comes together for God to say, I know who you are. I'm never going to lead you to do something you don't want to do. So what do you want to do? And if we trust him, even when he's leading in a direction I don't agree with, I trust him and obey and follow him even in that direction. And I delight myself in him. I get to live life doing what I want to do. And that's what God's called all of us to. He restores my soul. And he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Do you need to be restored? Have you wandered away and fallen? Do you need to be restored and set back on the path? Only he 
can restore you. But when he does, you have to follow. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the message you've given us today. Goodness, we so need this. This is good for us. Many of us have been praying for a long time that you would show us what you want us to do. And you've revealed to us today, we just need to be doing what you've already said. So we're going to trust you today, and we're going to do what you've told us to. And we're going to do our best to delight in you. And as we delight in you, Father, you're going to give us an opportunity to to live life not under a bunch of rules and regulations, but with the freedom to do what we were made to do. We enjoy doing. We love. Thank you for that privilege. You are our shepherd. In Jesus' name, amen. And if he's not your shepherd today, that's the first step you need to take. We want to give you an opportunity to do that. Maybe that you need someone to pray with you. You've got a concern. I'd love the opportunity to pray with you in those moments. But let's just stand together as we listen carefully to God and what he might be saying from what we've discovered together. Jesus, I surrender all to Him. I freely give. I will never love and trust Him in His presence daily. 